Hello. So let's recall that last time we defined the Fourier transform of a function in L1 of R. And we also discussed several computations of Fourier transforms. We did the Fourier transform of the characteristic function of minus 1, 1. It was 2 sin chi by chi. We discussed uh, other examples such as the Fourier transform of 1 upon x squared plus a squared which is related to the Cauchy distribution in probability theory and we discussed the Fourier transform of e to the power minus a x squared. The most important example is that of the Gaussian. The Fourier transform of the Gaussian was another Gaussian. This is something that we saw right in the first chapter but we again looked at it uh, from a different perspective, we did this calculation using complex analysis. Now we shall introduce the Schwarz space of rapidly decreasing functions. This is a very convenient function space to work with. This Schwarz space is a subset of L1 of R. So all the elements in the Schwarz space will have a Fourier transform. So this is a convenient class of functions introduced by Laurent Schwarz in his influential work Theory des Distributions, Hermann Paris, as I indicated in the slides. This function, spa this function space has the advantage that it is a vector space and is closed under differentiation as well as multiplication by polynomials. If you want a function space to be closed under differentiation. That means if I differentiate the function, it should again be in my vector space. So it must contain, so it must consist of C infinity functions only. It can't have anything else. Further, we want the functions to decay. And we, it should decay even after multiplication by polynomials. So these are some very stringent requirements. And um, we can also show later that functions which are in L1 can be approximated by this Schwarz class S. In fact, this space S of rapidly decreasing functions is dense in Lp of R for every P between 1 and infinity, 1 included, infinity excluded. And one first proves the results on Fourier transforms in S and resorts to approximation techniques. The situation is reminiscent of the proof of the Parseval formula where in the context of Parseval formula we first proved it for a convenient class of functions and we approximated it. Let us get to the definition. The space S consists of infinitely differentiable functions f of t such that for any natural numbers m and n, I differentiate the function n times and I multiply it by t to the power m. Then the result should again be bounded. So it should be bounded. So for example, taking n equal to 0 and m equal to 0, the function f of t itself must be bounded. Taking m equal to 0, and n equal to 1, 2, 3, etc., the derivatives must all be bounded. And then by taking n and m arbitrary, not only are the derivatives bounded, after multiplying the derivatives by powers of t, it must still be bounded. So there's a lot of demands. This class of functions is a very convenient class because of these decay properties. If this is true, then this is going to remain true when I multiply this by c, and take linear combinations. And so it means that if I take a polynomial p of t, then p of t times any derivative should be bounded. The function e to the power minus a t squared obviously has these properties. e to the power minus a t squared is certainly in the Schwarz class because it is rapidly decreasing. You differentiate it any number of times and you multiply it by any polynomial, it will remain in the Schwarz class. For the same reason, pt times e to the power minus at squared, that will also be in the Schwarz class. So we already have quite a good supply of elements in the 
Schwarz class. Are there any others? There are plenty of others. First, let us take the hyperbolic cosine, cosh at, where I'm going to take a not equal to zero. In fact, I'm going to take a positive because cosh is an even function. So I'm going to take cosh at. Cosh at grows exponentially fast. Cosh at grows exponentially fast. So one upon cosh at will decay to zero very rapidly. Of course, one should be sure that cosh at doesn't vanish because if it were to vanish, then I cannot take its reciprocal. But it's an easy exercise for you. Directly from the definition, you can check that cosh at does not vanish for any real t. Remember, a is already real. And so, 1 upon cosh at is definitely a smooth function. It decays very rapidly as t goes to infinity. You differentiate it any number of times and you multiply it by any power of t, it will decay rapidly. And so these functions cosh at inverse, they are in the Schwarz class. What about sinh at? 1 upon sinh at also has the same behavior as t goes to infinity. There's only one small problem, one tiny little problem we have to deal with. Where does sinh at vanish? A is real positive and t is real. Sinh at vanishes exactly at one value, namely t equal to 0. So 1 upon sinh at is not going to be smooth. It's not even going to be continuous. Multiplied by t. t by sinh at is going to be a smooth function because limit as t tends to 0, t by sinh at exists. It is 1 upon a. So assign the value 1 upon a at the origin and with this assignment, t by sinh at is an element of the Schwarz class. These are easy exercises for you to do. Some other examples of Schwarz class, some more exotic example. Here is one. Take the familiar gamma function. I hope you all remember the gamma function from elementary calculus courses. So take the gamma function gamma z. What is gamma z? Integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus t t to the power z minus 1. This function is holomorphic in the right half plane. This function gamma z is holomorphic in the right half plane. So in the right half plane, I take a vertical line, vertical line a plus i t, where a is real positive and t is an arbitrary real number. In other words, I restrict the gamma function to a vertical line in the right half plane, take its absolute value and square it. Mod gamma a plus i t, the whole squared. That's an element in the Schwarz space S. And I leave it as an optional exercise. You probably want to use the Stirling's approximation formula or some other technique that you may think about. Some of the properties of S. If you take two functions f and g in S, then obviously f plus g is also in S. And take a function f in S, c times f is also in S. This class S is a vector space. It's very evident that this class is a vector space. But something more is true. I already indicated to you that if a function is in S, its derivative is also in S. If a function is in S and I take a polynomial Pt, then the, then the product polynomial Pt times f of t is also in S. More generally, if you take two functions f and g which are in S, then the product f into g is also in S. Here, of course, polynomials are not in S. They are special. They are special cases where the product is in S. In, instead of a polynomial, if I replace it by e to the power t, answer is false. It is not true that if f of t is in S and I take the exponential function, e to the power t times f of t is in S. You have to find a counter example. For every f of t in S, you take the absolute value of 
f of t and integrated over r and that is finite and so elements of s are absolutely summable they are in l1 of r and the Fourier transform is defined for every function f in the Schwarz space s. Now we are going to show that if you have a function f of t in s then the Fourier transform also lies in s. This is one of the most pleasant features about the Schwarz space that it is invariant under Fourier transforms. Now you might ask what happens with L1? Why can't we take a function in L1 and look at its Fourier transform? Let us take a simple function in L1, the characteristic function of minus 1, 1. The characteristic function of minus 1, 1. What is the Fourier transform? Is the Fourier transform again in L1? No. So I have given you a simple example of a function in L1 whose Fourier transform is not in L1. So this is the problem of working with L1. L1 is not very convenient to deal with when it comes to Fourier transform. Whereas S is very convenient. This Schwarz class is very convenient. It is invariant under the Fourier transform. Also let us look at the list of examples of Fourier transforms that you have computed. Try to find some eigenvalues of the Fourier transform. Try to find some of the eigenvalues of the Fourier transform looking at the examples. The Fourier transform maps S to S. The Fourier transform is a linear transformation from S to S. And so it's of interest to know what are its eigenvalues. I can give you another, another exercise. We know that cosh AT inverse is in S. Try to find the Fourier transform of cosh AT inverse using complex analysis, using Cauchy integral theorem. Try to find the Fourier transform of this. And we can see whether there are more eigenvalues and more eigenfunctions and we will get all of them very soon. The first theorem, if F is in S, we know that the Fourier transform is also in S. But we have not proved it, we have just stated it, but we need to look at the proof of this. First thing is, let us write the definition of the Fourier transform. F hat of chi equal to integral minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus i t chi f of t dt. Let us differentiate under the integral sign with respect to chi. Differentiating under the integral sign is permissible because when I differentiate under the integral sign with respect to chi, each time I differentiate, I'm going to pick up power of t and a constant. Constant of course comes out of the integral and these powers of t will get clubbed with this f of t. But f of t is the Schwarz class. So t to the power n times f of t is also in the Schwarz class. So t to the power n f of t is in L1. So this differentiation under the integral sign is permissible. And now let us write the integrand as e to the power minus i t chi t to the power n f of t 1 plus t squared into 1 plus t squared inverse. The bracketed term is bounded in absolute value and so we multiply by minus i chi to the power k, multiply by minus i chi to the power k and we put one i below we put one i below and we say that this is equal to minus 1 to the power n integral minus infinity to infinity d dt of e to the power minus i t chi t to the power n f of t dt. Integration by parts and using the fact that the derivatives of t to the power n f of t also lie in s, we conclude that chi to the power k dn f hat of chi is also bounded for every n k. So this, so what we have done is that we have differentiated the Fourier transform n times and you multiplied it by chi to the power k. These i's that float around are innocent constants that have been introduced for our own convenience so that the expression of the left hand side can be conveniently written like this and we can check that this particular object over here is bounded so we conclude that f hat is in the Schwarz class.
Now that we know the S is invariant under the Fourier transform, that is if, if a function is in the Schwarz class, its Fourier transform is also in the Schwarz class. We know this, so now we can do other things. We can prove that if f is in the Schwarz class, and if I differentiate the function and then take the Fourier transform, that is the same as first taking the Fourier transform and multiplying by chi, except for the existence of this factor i here. So 1 upon i d dt. So Fourier transform of 1 upon i d dt f is chi times f hat. On the other hand, if I first multiply by the independent variable and I take t f t and then take the Fourier transform, it is minus 1 upon i d d chi f hat of chi. So these two formulas go hand in hand. The formulas essentially tell you that the Fourier transform exchanges 1 upon i d d t and multiplication by chi except that in one of the formulas there is a minus sign involved. To prove the first part, simply integrate by parts and you will get the first equation. So let us do the second one. I leave the first one for you as an exercise with a hint. To do the second part, you differentiate the integral with respect to chi. So first write the definition of the Fourier transform f hat of chi equal to integral minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus i t chi f of t dt differentiate with respect to chi and take the derivative under the integral sign it is minus i t e to the power minus i t chi f of t dt. You divide by minus i and you get the second formula straight. So these two formulae have been established and recorded as theorem 42. Let us now come to the Hermite's differential equation and Hermite's polynomials. The Hermite's differential equation is this ODE y double prime minus 2xy prime plus 2 lambda y equal to 0. So this is the Hermite's ODE. This ODE appears in quantum mechanics. You can for example refer to any books on quantum mechanics. For example, you can look at Robert Resnick's quantum physics or you can look at quantum mechanics by Pauling and Wilson, Linus Pauling and Wilson that is published by Dover. So this differential equation has a series solution. So you have probably uh, derived the series solutions of this differential equation in your elementary differential equation scores. But let us do something else. Let us make the substitution y e to the power minus x squared by 2 equal to u. So let us make or y equal to u e to the power x squared by 2. When you make the substitution, you, the differential equation for u assumes a simple form u double prime minus x squared u plus 2 lambda plus 1 u equal to 0. The beauty of the transformed equation is that there is no middle term minus 2xy prime. Now, assume that u is a solution of the transformed ODE. Then if I formally take the Fourier transform, then you will realize that u hat also is a solution of the same differential equation. The reason is because when you take the Fourier transform of u double prime, I am going to get minus x squared Fourier transform of u. When I take the Fourier transform of minus x squared u, I am going to get the second derivative of u hat. You got to use theorem 42 twice and the differential equation remains invariant under Fourier transform thanks to theorem 42 in the previous slides. So the next problem is to show that the equation y double prime minus 2xy prime plus 2 lambda y equal to 0 when the parameter lambda is a natural number including 0 has a polynomial solution of degree exactly n. That is the Hermite's differential equation that you see in the previous exercise when lambda takes a positive integer value has a polynomial solution. Now you must prove 
that there is only one polynomial solution up to scalar multiples. Any one of these polynomial solutions of degree n is denoted by hn of x. Unlike the case of the Legendre polynomials, there is no universally accepted normalization for these Hermit polynomials. We shall use this Hermit polynomials very soon. The next problem is to rewrite the Hermit's ODE in self-adjoint form. What is self-adjoint form? Take this differential equation that you see in exercise 14, y double prime minus 2xy prime plus 2 lambda y equal to 0, multiplied by e to the power minus x squared. When you multiply by e to the power minus x squared, the first two terms will combine to give you ddx of e to the power minus x squared y prime. So that's how you get the self-adjoint form of the Hermite's differential equation. Now use this particular form to show that if m and n are distinct natural numbers, then e to the power minus x squared by 2 times the mth Hermit polynomial is orthogonal to e to the power minus x squared by 2 times the nth Hermit polynomial. That is, these two functions that you see displayed in the last line are orthogonal in the Hilbert space L2 of R. At most, one of the solutions of the transformed OD lies in S. Now, the tricky question is the following. How do you know that the Hermit's equation has a solution which is lying in the Schwarz class? What we have proved is, we have proved that if differential equation in U has a solution which is in the Schwarz class, and the Fourier transform is also a solution of the same differential equation. Now I am telling you something else. Now I am telling you that this differential equation in U cannot have two linearly independent solutions which are in the Schwarz class. Only one at most can be in the Schwarz class up to multiples of course. So now this will tell you that if it has a solution in the Schwarz class, then the Fourier transform, which is also a solution of the same equation, must be a multiple of u. So that solution u must be an eigenfunction of the Fourier transform operator. Now, if lambda belongs to n, then the hn e to the power minus x squared by 2, where hn is a nth Hermit polynomial. Now this polynomial times e to the power minus x squared by 2 lies in S and this particular object hn x minus x squared by 2 is a solution of the U equation. So what exactly are we saying? We have to remember that in the first exercise you have the Hermit's differential equation y double prime minus 2xy prime plus 2 lambda y equal to 0. You must solve the Hermit's equation using power series and you will realize that when lambda is an integer, this Hermit's differential equation has a polynomial solution and that polynomial will have degree n and that degree n polynomial is called hnx. That's the nth Hermit polynomial. Thanks to this first exercise that you have done, it follows that if hn is the nth Hermit polynomial multiplying by e to the power minus x squared by 2 furnishes us a u which is a solution of this differential equation. So this differential equation is invariant under the Fourier transform and it has a unique solution in the Schwarz class. Therefore, hn e to the power minus x squared by 2 and its Fourier transform both satisfy the same differential equation. So hn e to the power minus x squared by 2 Fourier transform must be a multiple of hn e to the power minus x squared by 2. In other words, we have an eigenfunction of the Fourier transform operator. Okay. Now what about solving exercise 16? How do you show that there is at most one solution of this U equation in the Schwarz class. 
you use the abel lewell formula you use the abel lewell formula what is the abel lewell formula in elementary differential equation y double prime plus p x y prime plus q x y equal to 0 second order od take the ronskian w take the ronskian w then you got a differential equation for w right you get a first order od for the ronskian and this first order od for the ronskian can be integrated and you can determine the ronskian now if p is 0 if the differential equation has no middle term y prime term then this ronskian is going to be a constant so that is the case with the u equation right there is no u prime term so if i take two solutions u1 and u2 of the u equation the ronskian is going to be constant and if i take two linearly independent solutions the ronskian should be a non zero constant now what is the ronskian u1 u2 u1 prime u2 prime if u1 and u2 are both in the Schwarz class, what happens to the first row? u1, u2, u1 prime, u2 prime. What happens to this as you go to infinity? It goes to 0. But the Ronskin is constant. So it must, it must be identically 0. So u1 and u2 must be linearly dependent. So if I take two solutions of this differential equation, which are in the Schwarz class, then the Ronskian must be identically 0. And so those two solutions must be linearly dependent. So one of them must be a multiple of the other. So this way you can determine a large number of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions for the Fourier transform operator. I think it's a good time to stop this lecture here. We'll continue this next time. Thank you very much.